Um, so I'll just introduce myself quickly. So I'm Julia Black and I'm um, Interim Director at the LSE and I'm also Pro-Director for Research. And one of my great privileges as Pro-Director of Research is that I am well, responsible for the library, which is basically Nicola Wright, who's our wonderful librarian, tells me what she's doing and I say that sounds marvellous. Um, and it's one of my, I love the library and I love the collection and the Booth collection is obviously our one of the jewels, as it were, in the, in the library's collection crown. We're enormously proud to have it. And if you haven't been to see the exhibition in the library space on the ground floor of the library, then I do urge you to go and see that. It is absolutely fantastic. So I'm incredibly proud, actually, to be in this very privileged position of um, ostensibly managing the library, which has, and we are enormously proud of, um, of the Booth collection. I'm now going to hand over to John. Right. And, um, and you may want to watch the slides, possibly. You may, you may be more comfortable. Yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to step off the stage and watch the slides. Right. Uh, good afternoon. Is the sound system working? Yeah, yeah fantastic. Okay, um, so um, it's um, a great pleasure to be here um, as part of the LSE Research Festival and to be celebrating um, the centenary, sadly, of the death of Charles Booth, but, but particularly marking... Um, the contribution that his wonderful maps, um, maps, copies of which have hung outside my various offices for the last 15 years, um, have made to our understanding of poverty and inequality um, in London in particular. Um, I should say that um, I'm going to be using colleagues' work um, in, in what I'm saying this evening, um, but also that um, I've been helped enormously by Billy Amquist Duran. Um, who's part of the Inequalities Institute. Um, now, part of my motivation in, in all of this um, is a modern contrast um, in some of the results of qualitative work done recently and continuing um, by my colleagues, uh, both in the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion um, and in the International Inequalities Institute. Um, this is from recent work by Anne Power that you heard from earlier and her colleagues in CASE, um, looking at um, debt and resilience in the London borough of Newham. It was in those days, um, there was rather less of Newham uh, than there is today. Um, this is a description of one of their interviewees. Um, um, Anne, her troubles started when her husband passed away in 2010. In 2011, she herself was diagnosed with cancer. By 2013, she was very worried about the bedroom tax. She knew how it would affect her, but she didn't know how to deal with her present debts and bills. In October 2013, she was evicted and made homeless. Her rent increased from £65 to £150 a week. She resorted to a payday loan when she had to move, but she couldn't afford to pay it back. Now they're catching up with me because um, I'm paying the council tax, Part of her problem was her arrears on her council tax. So they can find where I am. I, keep ignoring, I can't keep ignoring these people. That's why I'm going to get it sorted. I'd have liked them really to listen to what I said. I was paying off the arrears before the bedroom tax went on. If they had given me a proper council place, let me take the arrears to one bedroom place, it wouldn't have happened. So that's recent work, continuing work, which we're extending um, in, the next, um, in the next few months um, on debt in Newham. This is at the other end. Um, this is uh, Mayfair in, in Booth's maps. You'll see the um, gold and, and red uh, beginning to appear. Um, this is actually um, taken from, um, you may be surprised to know that the Guardian journalist Polly Toynbee and David Walker, um, also from the Guardian, they're clearly their favourite reading in 2007 at the peak of the boom um, was the upmarket magazine The Tatler, um, which pointed at this point to the relentless rise of the super-rich, dividing the upper-income classes into two tribes, the have-a-lots and the stress-a-lots. London is more than paved in gold, it is coated in it. Well, that was um, July 2007. Um, by 2011, Luna Glucksberg um, from the Inequalities Institute um, uh, uh, quotes here, um, the Savills property... Um, firm, uh, estate agents, so as billionaires displace multi-millionaires from the top addresses, so they in turn displace the millionaires, and so housing wealth and the prime effect spread. 
And these are, this is one of her unfortunate interviewees talking about her son, John. John grew up in Kensington, um, towards the top of the, the map. And he would really have liked to stay in Kensington, but there's no way they could have afforded the kind of house they want. Well, anything, it's just ridiculous, the property prices. That was Alison talking about what was happening um, in Kensington. Now, my argument this evening is that those experiences are connected. Um, that there's a chain that runs between the top and the bottom. And this, those reading those interviews reminded me of a completely wonderful 1980s television drama um, written by Jack Col Gold and uh, written by um, Jack uh, Rosenthal and produced by Jack Gold called The Chain. Um, I have to say that this wonderful movie is available on DVD still from online retailers who are not registered in Saal in Luxembourg. Uh, now, what the chain did was to tell the story of a single day in London and what happened to the people who were moving house in that day with people, one person moving into the house that was being displaced by the other. It started with a young man from Hackney moving out of the room in his mother's house, moving in with his girlfriend um, into rented accommodation in Tufnell Park. In turn, the couple who weren't getting on terribly well, it has to be said, um, from, from Tufnell Park were moving into, were buying um, their first flat in Willesden. The young family in Willesden were moving into a larger um, house, a large, yes, a flat, a whole house, um, in Hammersmith, where they were rather unfortunate that um, the, the man leaving it was Nigel Hawthorne, um, we mainly think of as being rather benign um, from his, many of his parts, um, but in this case he was removing the light bulbs and the light fittings before he, met, he left and moved to Hampstead. Um, eventually, when the lady who was in Hampstead <coughs> could be persuaded to move out, um, she was moving into rather grander accommodation in Holland Park and um, they were moving into a house currently being occupied by a wealthy millionaire in Knightsbridge. And you will have to read the, you'll have to, to watch the film um, if you can, which I highly recommend, um, to get the philosophy of the, and I mean philosophy, of the, um, the removal drivers, particularly one played by Warren Mitchell uh, along the way. Now, that was the 1980s when you could contemplate those kinds of moves in that kind of chain. The world has changed. We have a much bigger population um, than we had then. If you compare the number of households in England, and I'm going to be concentrating on numbers uh, for England and then London through a lot of this, uh, we have five million more households in England than we had back um, in, um, 19, um, in, 19, in the 1980s. Um, on the other hand, we also have five million more dwellings. The orange line there giving the number of dwellings. So although we see around us the effects of the housing shortage, the balance between the number of households and the number of dwellings in England, ha England has not deteriorated, maybe a tiny bit in the most recent year, 2015. Uh, now that is a little different in London, in London, the number of, of, of dwellings kept ahead of the number of households um, up until about 2013. And the last two years here, um, really since the crisis, the number of households has, um, kept, has, has moved ahead of the number of households. So we see um, some of the stress. And we know some of the effects of this. So if you look at the statistics for overcrowding, this is... Um, these are figures for the whole of England, and they're by tenure. So the grey line here is the proportion of social renters, social tenants, who are living in what are labelled by um, communities and local government as overcrowded households. That is, they've got um, fewer bedrooms, I think it is, than the, the statutory number. Um, and you see those numbers rising, particularly for the private rented sector. We're starting here in 1995, 
going through, and although actually that dips slightly at the end, there's even a little bit, not much of a rise um, for own occupiers. And that begins to give us a clue of, about what's going on. But overcrowding, and we, we hear many stories about the quality of conditions at the bottom. So obviously, we all know the drivers of this. There is not enough housing. We have not built enough. There isn't enough space for everybody who's come into the country. Well, if you look at the number of dwellings we have, and I'm looking just now at the post-crisis period, really the most recent crisis period, um, the um, number of dwellings we have in England has risen from by one and a half million, uh, one, sorry, 1.2 million. And the average floor space in those dwellings has gone from 91 square meters, on average, the mean, to 94, 95 square meters. We've got more dwellings, and we've got more dwelling space, more residential space. This is including, I have to say, vacant dwellings. Now, if you put those two numbers together, you see what has happened to the total amount of residential floor space in England. It's gone from 2,229 square kilometers to 2,192 square kilometers. Now, it's hard to imagine. I mean, if you multiply the numbers, you get, uh, you get, um, they, they get expressed in, in um, um, millions of, of meters, but it's easier to think about them as square kilometers. Now, that's a lot of space. This is London. Um, this is London, actually, it's colored in according to the, the level of rents in each area for, for what that's worth. If you superimpose the space, the residential space we had in 2008, if you turned every square meter of, floor, of, of first floors, of bedrooms, and put them all together into a single national bungalow, an English bungalow, it would be 45 kilometers um, by 45 kilometers. So it would roughly go round the M25. There wouldn't be any streets, there wouldn't be any parks, there wouldn't be any two-story houses, but there would be continuous residential accommodation within the M25. What we've done just in those six years is to exp expand the um, residential floor space in the country like this. It's been eating into the green belt. I'm sure that would rather upset um, Anne, um, as that would go against many of her principles. We've got more space, even after the recession, even after the crisis, even after the slowdown in building. We've got more space. We've even got more space per person. So I did some work um, 10 years ago for the um, communities and local government department. Um, I have to say, I think every single recommendation I made in the report that came out of that was reversed by last year's housing plan and planning bill. Um, but one of the things that struck me at the time was that at that point we had more floor space per person than we had ever had. I hadn't looked at the numbers since then, but these are the numbers since then. If you multiply up, we've got the floor space here, the population which has indeed grown, the population has grown by um, about 5%, but the floor space has grown by 8.5%, so we have more floor space per person. We have a housing crisis, but we've got more room. Well, um, does that mean that we don't have a housing shortage at all? Well, it depends who those gains have gone to. Overwhelmingly, the gains have gone to owner-occupiers, so from 41 and a half square meters per person. This is occupied dwellings. It doesn't include the second homes. It doesn't include the vacant dwellings. Vacant dwellings have fallen rather fast in London, um, but this is occupied space. Um, it's grown for owner-occupiers. It's actually grown for social tenants. Um, it's shrunk slightly within the private rented sector. Um, so it's gone particularly, the increase in space has gone to owner-occupiers. It's particularly gone to larger properties. It, this would be very hard to see at the back. But coloured in gold here um, are properties of more than 110 square metres um, per property. 
um, down at the bottom are properties that are less than 50 metres um, of, of property. This is taking 2001 through 2012. So, so where the space has gone is to create larger dwellings or to make bigger dwellings bigger. Those swimming pools at the bottom of um, Chelsea houses um, which may count. I don't know whether they count them as residential floor space. I, I, I think we probably did. Um, um, but they're all flat. They're, they're not in basements anymore in my national bungalow. Um, so they've gone, um, so it's gone to larger dwellings. And it's also become more unequal. Now, this is not floor space per person. This is work by Becky Tunstall, our former colleague, um, who um, looked all the way back, not, she didn't have the data to do this for floor space, but this is looking simply at the number of rooms per person back to 1911. The number of rooms per person for the people who had got the least number of rooms per person, um, the 10th percentile, and the number of people who got the most rooms um, per person. So um, by the 2011 census, uh, the people with the most number of rooms per person um, had hit five rooms per person. These are, these are the spare bedrooms, um, the growth in the country's number of spare bedrooms. And so you see going down. Um, but between 1991 and 2011, over those 20 years, there was no improvement. It stayed at one, one room per person um, for people um, at the bottom. So we have this increase in space, but we have an increase in inequality in the use of that space. I said at the beginning that there was a chain that connected the experiences of the top and the experiences of the bottom. Um, I want to just focus on three of those links. Um, the first of those links I mean, is this. Um, I grew up with the idea that what banks did was to take my small amounts of savings and other people like me, put them into an enormous pot and lend them to entrepreneurs who would use that money, would be lent it long term so they could invest to build factories, to invest, um, to, to grow the economy. This is from Adair Turner's book, uh, Between Debt and the Devil, published um, earlier this year using work by Jorda Shularik and Taylor. And it shows across 17 countries where bank lending goes. In the past, 30%, so back to the 1880s and 1900s, 30% of bank lending went to residential property across industrialized economies. By 2010, um, nearly 60% of bank lending was going on loans for residential property, uh, for real estate lending. Not just that, it wasn't financing new property, some of it was, but overwhelmingly, it's financing the repurchase of existing property, particularly the most valuable property, the most sought after property that you, you can't make Kensington um, all over again. Um, now the effect of that is of course to drive up house prices. Um, now normally in an irregular market, if the price of something goes up, everything taught in this institution, well, actually not everything, but Economics 101, would be teaching that if the price of something goes up, you would expect the demand for it to go down. But in this case, it doesn't work like that for owner-occupiers, as those of you who are owner-occupiers know. Um, that what happens is that, yes, housing is more expensive, but the house you're occupying becomes more valuable, and your wealth rises in line with that. The cost of actually occupying the property doesn't change. There's no change in your taxation. Your council tax doesn't rise as your property becomes more valuable. There's no, there's no tax on the capital gains. There's no tax on the value of living in a more expensive property. You are your own landlord, so although a notional value of where you're living goes up, your income as a notional landlord goes up with it. You could, of course, trade down and decide, actually, instead of it occupying this now ridiculously expensive property, um, I could go move somewhere cheaper and go on holiday and buy a more expensive car. But not much of that happens. There's no particular pressure to do it. In fact, some of the pressure is the exact reverse. We all know that the best form of investment is property. 
And we've experienced, although people tend to forget what happened in July 1989, look it up if you, if you think that house prices only ever go up, uh, they could trade down, but they don't because it's seen as the best investment. In fact, as house prices rise, people have seen it as even better property, and so people stay put. And as they stay put, their wealth goes up, but the wealth has gone up of a particular set of people, a particular generation. This is from part of Working Case on the Distribution of Wealth. It's joint work with Francesca Bastali, looking using the British Household Panel Survey, looking at the wealth of the same people by their initial age, 25-year-olds over here, 75-year-olds over here, in 1995, and then um, after the main effects of the house price boom um, across the UK. So this huge increase in, in wealth, far more than anybody was saving, but created by the increase um, in house prices. Um, that's linked to the obverse of what I showed in terms of under, uh, over occupation, in terms of what communities and local government call under occupation. I think under occupation is two or more extra bedrooms compared with what the standard would need, I think. Um, somebody else, Chris Hamlet, is, is probably in the room, would know the answer to that. For owner occupiers, the proportion who have got two or more spare bedrooms has gone um, from 40% in the mid 1990s to um, 50% in the most recent figures. It's declined for the, for the tenants. For tenants, the situation is different. The pressures on tenants are different. But there's another group that life is difficult for, and that is poor old James. It's tougher for, um, uh, for future owners if you don't yet own. You can't afford to build that, buy that nice little house in Kensington you were thinking of. Except, maybe you could. I mean, this is another of the, the part of the work from Case in our report, Falling Behind, Getting Ahead, that we produced last year. This is wealth by age. And the, the black line here is median household work, wealth from the ONS Wealth Massive Survey across the UK. And of course, one of the striking figures is the difference between households aged around 60 and households aged around um, 30. Uh, the black line showing the median there. And those of you um, who've heard me talk about this particular piece of work before, you'll know if you're age 30 that all you have to do if you're currently age 30 to get to where typical 60 year olds are today is to save 33 pounds a day every day for the next 30 years. And then you'll catch up with a generation that benefited from the defined benefit pensions and the house price boom. Now that's why poor old Anne's poor old, uh, no, what's her name, Alison's poor old James um, is in such trouble. Um, well, not necessarily, because over here are Alison's parents. And I've got here the range between the poorest of the 85 year olds and the, the wealthiest of the, the 85 year olds. This wealth is not going to disappear, the pension rights will, but most of that wealth will not disappear, it will leapfrog. Possibly, it may go to the first generation, but it's more likely to leapfrog down here. So I'm not quite so sorry for James, because I suspect that somewhere along the line, part of the chain that will insulate him and will him allow him not necessarily to live in Kensington, but not so far away, um, will be um, what comes both from his parents um, and his grandparents. So another link, a second link in the chain is the inequality of in inheritance. I, I won't go through the details of this, but this is of looking at people in 1995 according to their wealth. Um, at that point, um, the typical wealth of people in the top fifth, the households in the top fifth um, in this survey, which rather understates what's going on at the top, more than £400,000 um, at the bottom, um, minus £6,000. 36% of the inheritance went to the people at the top. This is work by Eleni Karagniaki from, um, from Case. So inheritance and the extent to which it's skewed is one of the things that fuels the chain that I'm describing. But for tenants, it's different. For tenants, the effects of rising house prices is that rents go up. 
Now, that used not to be so much the case for social tenants. Social tenants with rents set may be rising with inflation, may be rising with inflation plus 1% for a, a lot of recent period. But that's no longer the case as we move from social rents to affordable rents set as a percentage of private rents. Um, and where property is now seen, where its value has gone up, having no effect whatsoever on its current inhabitants, it's the, the owner-occupiers' values have gone up next, next door with the owner-occupiers protected, but this is now a valuable asset, which under the Housing and Planning Act um, of um, last year, or was it? No, this year still. This year. Um, uh, will be, if it's, if it's council housing, will be sold off in order to finance uh, the right to buy um, for housing association tenants. Or alternatively, we get the process which Anne described earlier on in terms of the modern idea, David Cameron, uh, no longer with us, but David Cameron talked um, about clearing um, 100 estates um, because there was more value in them with maybe a little bit of the social housing replaced while we did it and Anne was also talking about the effects on some of the estates where that process has happened. So, so for tenants, the effects of rising property prices have been very different. Now, um, if you come along to here um, in exactly um, however many days it is till Wednesday the 7th of December at 6.30, we have a lecture which is to be given by Robert Frank um, where he's talking about his new book, Success and Luck. Um, and I highly recommend that having recently read the book. Now, his main, um, his main thesis is about the extent to which getting to the top is about personal effort, personal, um, personal virtue, and personal, um, uh, personal talent, um, as opposed to maybe um, just being lucky. But as a little aside in that, um, he produces the following graph, which he describes as the toil index. This is the number of hours per month that somebody earning the median wage in the US would have to work in order to pay the median monthly rent. And his point is that through what's happened recently, that's gone from, in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, from about 42 hours a month to 100 hours a month. Those are the medians in, the two, in, in, in both sides. Um, now, in the UK, it hasn't been so dramatic. These are, these are the numbers for England. In fact, if you take England as a whole, um, and you take the longer period, this is uh, the, the period since 2008, so this is a narrow period than his, it hasn't changed very much. Um, it's been, it, it's, it started off, uh, if we start in 2008, um, rather similar to where the US was at the same time. These, so these are median um, English, um, how many hours of medium wage work in the UK you need to to work to, um, to pay the median private rent. Uh, but it is a bit different in London. Um, a Londoner earning the median wage in London now has to work 10 more hours a month in order to pay the median rent in, in London, just comparing 20, um, 2011 with 2014. <coughs> And in fact, the increase is not just 10 hours a month. If you allow for taxes, it's more likely to be, and national insurance and so on, it's more likely to be an extra 13 hours a month you're working for your landlord. Your landlord being one of the beneficiaries of the house price boom. Um, <clears throat> now, the third link in my chain of the many other links there are in all of this is more political. It's about how we decided to cope with the effects of the financial crisis um, and the effects of um, the escalation, uh, the downturn after the financial crisis. The first effect was that government decided, particularly, well, the government decided in 2010 that it would not follow the course followed by um, Obama in the US. It would um, consolidate the public finances, it would reduce borrowing, which had risen at the end of the Labour government, um, but would cut the deficit. That left the Bank of England to try and do something about it, with interest rates down to a quarter of a percent, um, it seems now forever. That left them with quantitative easing, with pumping money into the economy, um, and it's something which has the immediate effect 
of raising the value of bonds, if somebody has promised that they will pay you £100 a year for the next 10 years and interest rates um, have gone down to virtually zero and they're being, those things that bonds are being bought up by the Bank of England, their price, their price goes up. But it also, I think, implies that the price of other real assets which generate a future return, like a house you can live in, will also have gone up as a result of quantitative easing. So on the one side, our attempt to reflate the economy, or Bank of England with its pushing at a piece of string um, attempt to reflate the economy, has the effect of increasing asset prices. On the other hand, we decided to restrict the public finances, cut the deficit, and crucially to do 80% of that by cuts, and only 20% of it by tax increases. And that meant a series, in particular, of, quote, welfare cuts. There were some things that were, there was some protection between 2010 and 2013, but a whole series of things that you're familiar with. Um, so less generous in indexation of benefits from year to year, um, and that, that's now extended into a four-year cash freeze in the value um, of, of, um, of benefits and tax credits. Um, crucially, council benefit cuts for working age people. Remember Anne, I think I've got the right case. Um, one of the things that happened to her, if it's not Anne, it's one of her other, uh, this Anne's other interviewees, her husband had always dealt with the council tax. Their council tax was always fully rebated. So they, they paid no net council tax. Um, he died. She, she was not a pensioner. She herself got pensioner, uh, got, um, got cancer. She didn't open the letters from the council, which would have told her that under the new rules, working age people were liable to 20% of the council tax. She accumulated arrears, and that ended up, with this Anne, or is it another case anyway, one of the cases, um, she ended up um, in court. She was also, as you saw from the quote, affected by the bedroom tax. Uh, now, of course, I showed you the increase in the number of spare rooms in the country. We're not using our space efficiently. The case for putting a price on those spare rooms, which is effectively what the bedroom tax does, is, as a general proposition, a rather good one. We don't put a tax on spare rooms. The bedroom tax affects 4% of the nation's spare rooms because it doesn't affect older people and it only affects social tenants. It does not affect the people who've got the 96% of the spare bedrooms. Alongside that, ever-tightening limits um, on housing benefit. Uh, those were originally set to cover the bottom 30% of, of local rents, um, but have only been uprated with CPI inflation since then, not actual rents. I'll come back to that. Now, the effects of this, and these are numbers from London. Oh, sorry, I've, I've, skipped, a, I've skipped a slide, sorry. The effects of this thinking of the distributional effects, looking at the, ma the mix we had between what were, not, for many people, not in fact tax increases, but were tax cuts. Um, they're in purple here, the income tax cuts at the top of the diagram. This is the population divided into 20ths, comparing the tax system as it was in May 2010 with that set in place before the last election in 2015-16, going all the way up to the top 20th of the population at the top, um, where people were gaining from things from more, like more valuable state pensions in real terms and the high, much higher value of the tax-free personal allowance. And you'll see that those, um, those benefit in particular, the, the greatest benefit goes to the top half of the population, but they are spread across it. At the bottom are the effects of the cuts in benefits compared with their value uprated for inflation. And so both uh, means-tested benefits and other benefits um, reduced. And there are some interesting effects in yellow on council tax, but I won't go into that. The net effect is that black line there. So even before you start allowing for things like value-added tax increases, the effect of the way we chose to rebalance the public finances was to move against the incomes of the bottom half of the population. Now that meant a cocktail of falling real wages most at the bottom until the national minimum wage increase this April, as we just learned um, earlier in the week, um, particularly in London. The constraints on things like housing benefit, particularly in London, this extraordinary drop of 18%, 19%, 
in the after housing cost incomes of, the, of people at the, the point where they're 10% from the bottom in London, simply over the period from, um, uh, from um, 2007-8 to 2012-13. So over the population as a whole, there was about a 5% drop um, in, um, in after housing cost income. That was a bigger drop um, in, um, in London. Um, so you see the median fall here was bigger in London. But it was extreme for people at the bottom in terms of what incomes they were left with um, at the bottom um, in London. And this has had geographical effects, going back to Charles Booth and the maps that we've all been showing this afternoon. This is a map produced by, um, um, by um, Alex um, Fenton um, back in 2010. Um, work done um, in Cambridge for Shelter, and I don't know whether, I don't really know whether this has been redone, because I'm just using his original numbers. What he's got here is our famous map of London, um, an inner London within the white dotted bit here and the river in blue going, going through the middle. Um, the areas that have been coloured black are not the um, areas that Charles Booth labelled um, in shorthand as vicious semi-criminal, um, those are the areas where um, the housing benefit caps imposed not so that people could afford to live in the poorest half, in, in the cheapest half of accommodation in their area that was the right size for their family, but in the bottom 30% of property. The areas coloured in black were where the housing benefit limits meant that people weren't in, in, in their term, in Alex Fenton's terms, um, affordable. Now, not only did the, did the changes in the housing benefit limits um, impose a lower limit at that point, they also set in, in train a process where those limits would only rise from year to year with CPI inflation. And we've just seen rents have risen much faster than CPI inflation. So the property that is, that is affordable with housing benefit is no longer the bottom 30% um, of, um, of, of accommodation area. It's a much smaller proportion of that. And it's a much smaller proportion in many areas than the number of people, even if they all, um, all recipients of housing benefit, um, crowded into the cheapest property and everybody else moved out of it, um, you still couldn't fit them in within the limits. This was Alex's projection of the unaffordable areas, um, again, coloured in in black, um, by 2014. I suspect if those numbers were really redone on the same basis, um, more of the London map um, would be coloured black um, than, than at this point. Um, so, one effect of this, which goes back to the housing crisis we all know about, is that there has been rising overcrowding in rented housing in London. Um, this is going from, um, for, this is social rented housing in red, going from 10% up to 15 or so percent, but particularly rising in private rented housing um, rapidly um, through, through the period the, the, of the post-war housing, of the, the post, of the, of the housing boom from 1995 onwards, with, uh, but with very little um, change in overcrowding um, in an occupation, as I showed you um, earlier. These are, these are London numbers. The second effect of this is, again, something that I think will be um, familiar, which is the way in which where people with low incomes live in London um, has changed. Now, this is a very particular measure, um, again, actually developed by Alex Fenton and colleagues um, within CASE, looking at the censuses in um, 2001 and, and 2011 um, in, in the report we produced um, last year, supported by the um, Trust for London, um, looking at, and there are many other things which show the same thing, but they show where um, areas, neighbourhoods, small areas, um, with the lowest poverty coloured in, in pink and the highest rates of poverty um, coloured um, in red. That was the situation in the 2001 census. Um, by the 2011 census, and there was other um, data showing similar things, we've got this push out, particularly along the Lee Valley um, up, in, up in the north, and the push away from Kensington type areas from, from inner, inner west London and there are, there's much other data um, talking about that. So putting this together, and of course this has just been um, a, a rather quick gallop through what's been going on, 
Um, um, this seems to me to link back to what um, Booth was showing in his map, showing on the larger scale. Um, I, sorry, I wasn't here for the earlier part of the afternoon, so somebody may already have talked about this. Um, but this is the bigger picture of inner London, um, where you see the pattern of Hyde Park and Regent's Park and the gold around them, the, at least the houses are coloured in in gold, even if the streets aren't paved in gold, and the red areas um, on the left, and the blacker areas, um, including uh, where we are now, uh, the black and blue areas, um, in, um, the lowest class vicious semi-criminals, um, um, towards the right of the diagram. And, and it's not an accident that it was that way around. If, I don't know whether anybody said this earlier this afternoon. It's that way around because of the prevailing winds. If you ask why Soweto in Johannesburg is called Soweto, it's because it's the southwest township. It's because the winds are northeasterlies, and they were blowing the dust and the muck from the, from the mines, and indeed the smoke from um, the houses, towards the southwest. So that's where they built Soweto. Well, it was the same through a slightly different process in, in the 19th century, that the smoke from the chimneys, the multiple and rather elegant chimneys of the bigger houses, blew towards um, the east, and that's why the map was coloured in the way it was. I think what I've been trying to argue this evening is that, of course, today we've got the Clean Air Act. Today we've actually got more space per person than would have been imaginable, I think, to, to Charles Booth. Uh, but it's the financial winds that have been blowing and the policy choices that have been made that are having the effects um, of, um, of, of driving the links in the chain, of rattling the links in the chain that I described at the beginning, um, which connect um, what's happening at the top, both through politics and through finance, through inheritance, through the policy decisions we've taken, to what's been happening at the bottom and some of the hardship we see there. Thank you all very much. Thank you, John. So I think we have, we have time for one round of, of questions. Um, and I know there's a huge amount that we could pick up on that. I am going to ask people if they could just briefly say their their name and keep their question to a question rather than a statement, keep it quite short. And I'll take uh, sort of three together, three or four together, and then um, uh, John can answer those, just so we can get as many in as we can. So if you'd like to ask a question, if you could just please raise your hand and then the people with the roving mics know where you are. Anyone else to ask a, ask a question? Or people want to get on with the or research festival. Or people want to get on with the research festival. Oh no, we have a question there, please. Thank you. I have worked in housing with young people um, who are a particularly disadvantaged group. Um, I mean, with your knowledge now, do you think we hope that we could change the Okay. So, where, will we see any change? Is there any hope on the horizon? So, then, a uh, person in the check shirt just in the middle of that row. Second question. <coughs> Thanks. Really interesting presentation. I guess kind of a linked comment. Uh, you know, all this discussion about our owner occupiers versus so social renters. Do you get a sense any of this is a kind of zero sum game, or there are opportunities that could kind of you know, improve uh, you know welfare of homeowners in addition to those uh, renting or you know younger people also? Okay, excellent. Do we have one more question? If not, uh, two. Oh, so uh, so, so some right at the back, at the top, at the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, you seem to be implying that people uh, who are under-occupying should somehow not be, uh, not be under-occupying. Um, but I would actually contest that. Uh, as people get older, they sometimes need more space. 
uh, and uh, I don't think they should be paying any penalty. If you're implying a tax penalty, I think that should be contested. Um, could you comment on that? Yeah. Okay, so I think that's three good questions. Okay, well, I mean, I think the... Uh, I'll try and link those three questions. I think the most hopeful thing for me in this is that we do actually have a lot of housing. A surprisingly large amount of housing, and we've been adding to it. Um, so there is a rather different shaped crisis from the one that we're familiar with. Um, so if we have more of it, some of it may be in the wrong place, some of that we may have been building in cheaper places where people don't want to live, a lot of the additions may have been people extending um, already quite well supplied homes, but we have got somewhere or other more space, and the question is how can we most efficiently use it in a way that is and achieve that in a way that is humane and <coughs> respects people's communities um, and where they live. Um, now, I do think that means there are opportunities. And going to the last point, I do think there are things that we should do that make it easier for people to downsize. And I think there are things we should do through the tax system, through the council tax system, that would put more of a price on the spare rooms of the empty nesters. Um, you might may need more space. Some of us may need more space for um, mobility aids, one kind or another, wider doorways or whatever. We don't necessarily need more rooms. Sometimes we need more rooms for a carer. We all like the idea of having rooms for our children and grandchildren um, to visit. But we've tipped it so that the incentive is to keep as much space and as much expensive space as possible. Um, it, maybe it's some combination of things, but so something where the council tax does bear a stronger direct relationship to, um, to the value of property rather than being um, a very flat tax where people in the, in the cheapest accommodation are paying um, a much larger percentage of its value than people in the more expensive property, even than would have been the case under the rates um, in the 19, in 1980s. Maybe some of that needs to be rolled up. Maybe people, even if we make it easier for people to downsize, and even if we make it easier for people to live closer to one another with denser services, um, with more facilities, um, they won't want to move, but then maybe some of those taxes could be rolled up um, and then be a charge um, on the estate um, alongside inheritance tax um, when people die, so that the people who pay that are, are, are the heirs rather than people themselves. If this is going to be, if the barrier to this is the often used um, elderly widow with, with very low income rattling around in a big, big house who's got very little means because she's income, she's asset rich but income poor, maybe we therefore take the money off the estate later on, we roll it up. There are, are ways of doing that. They're complicated. I, you were asked to start with about hope. Um, I find that a little difficult, particularly just at the moment, um, where even the effect of um, Brexit and the devaluation apparently has not been to diminish the um, attractiveness um, of London as a destination for people to um, store their wealth from other countries in what have been described as not so much um, flats but gold bricks um, sitting here, um, insulated from their own country's jur jurisdictions, possibly tax systems, um, which have the effect of pushing out our bankers um, into Kensington and pushing out poor old James um, to Islington, where he pushes out LSE academics and lawyers <laughs> who move further out, pushing out, um, pushing out regular workers um, to Walthamstow and eventually pushing some people like um, the Anne who was quoted in the, um, in the, in the um, um, research I quoted earlier, pushing people like her entirely off the edge. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we do now have to, to end the lecture and end the series for the day. Um, for those of you who've managed to stay through the day, I, I envy you. Actually, I wish I could have joined you for the rest of the day. I'm sorry I wasn't able to, but it seems to have been a fabulous series of lectures and events. Just before you leave, and just before we thank John, I just want to invite you to the Research Festival, which is just outside. Um, 
just a quick word on the research festival. This is a festival for um, LSE's researchers, academics, and students at all different levels to present their research in, uh, in different ways, through posters, pictures, three-minute thesis, lots of different challenging ways in which to present research which isn't, doesn't consist of 10,000 words with 157 footnotes uh, attached to it. It is just outside. There will be a prize giving um, at half past seven. There will be drinks and live music before then. And we've also got a booth-related uh, theme for, uh, for the prizes. Um, and a very absolutely delighted, actually, that Charles Booth's great-great-grandson, Christopher Stevens, will be presenting uh, the prize, the Booth Prize, that represents best his work on poverty and inequality. And people have also been voting for a popular prize throughout the day, which will also be uh, announced later on this evening. So please do join us outside. But before you do so, if we could just thank John, please, for a fantastic and very similar <laughs>